Is he planning on showing up at the Harvard bursar's office with like a duffel bag full of hundreds? And that's how he's going to pay his tuition. I don't think Harvard's going to look too favorably on that. That's not how you paid your tuition in life? Welcome to Pennies and Popcorn, the show about real money lessons from the world of TV and movies. With your hosts, Carla Cash and Robert Davidson, a couple of personal finance geeks and movie lovers. Today we're talking about the movie 21. This is kind of a weird show for us, Carla. Every show we've done so far has been about a TV show or a movie that we pretty much liked. Yeah, that we really kind of loved, actually, I think. And this is the first one where we're doing it because we think the money lessons are really great. But the movie itself, we're just kind of meh about. Yeah, the movie 21 is based on a book called Bringing Down the House. Uh, It's a book I read back when it came out in the early 2000s. The movie 21 uh, got its name because there's actually a Queen Latifah and Steve Martin movie by the name of Bringing Down the House. I totally missed that. That's funny. Yeah, you couldn't exactly have the same name for the book in the Queen Latifah movie and the Blackjack Card Counting movie. So it didn't work out. Became 21. (laughs) It made $160 million at the box office, but it's just kind of, it was a letdown. I really wasn't that excited when we saw it. I I believe we watched it with your parents for the first time. Hmm. And I was excited about it because I had read the book and I thought it was going to be really interesting. And it just seemed kind of corny and wasn't that great. It's a fun heist movie and there's a little bit of a romance and there's some good intrigue. I don't hate it, but yeah, it just feels like sort of a average, like kind of heist-ish movie. It's almost... It's not, I mean, I say heist, it's not like Ocean's Eleven style, but, you know, it's kind of about people trying to get away with something. Yeah. What's interesting is the casino's role in these movies, or in this movie, rather. You would think that the casinos wouldn't be that interested in presenting a movie all about how to take more money when you go to Vegas, but that that actually wasn't the way that it worked out. The casinos were happy to offer their spaces for filming and allow them to to go produce there because it was more of a free advertisement than a real lesson on how to go be an excellent card counter. Yeah. So I guess we should back up a little bit and say that the movie 21 is primarily about the game Blackjack and people who are counting cards to sort of get an advantage in the game of Blackjack and beat the house, beat the odds. Yeah. It's a story of a kid, Ben Campbell, He is a graduating MIT student. He's headed to medical school and he's going to Harvard Med. Brilliant guy. He aced his uh, MCATs. He's got a 4-0 at MIT. Real, real smart guy. But he doesn't have the money to go pay for medical school and he's pretty worried about it. He stumbles or he's really invited by his professor to join this card counting team that they have at MIT And at first, he's got a lot of reluctance. He has a lot of other projects he's working on, other things he's really excited about. And he's pretty skeptical about this whole thing. But he gets tempted by the money and eventually joins the team. Yeah, in fact, we have this great scene featuring Kate Bosworth telling him, You should feel the thrill of winning more money than you can possibly imagine. Which just makes me laugh and reminds me of the Han Solo quote from Star Wars. I don't know. I can imagine quite a bit. Which is so perfect. Like, it's just, he, he is exactly right. Like, I can imagine quite a lot of money. And <laughs> I can imagine quite a bit more that we ultimately find out that Ben has taken home as a result of his blackjack gambling. Yeah, like I said, it's just kind of a, a little bit corny in parts of the movie. But nevertheless, he joins the team and it's the story of him making his money and all of the adventures and misadventures along the way. Yeah, that sounds about right. That pretty much sums up the movie. So a couple of fun facts about it. Sure. So as you said, the movie is based on the book Bringing Down the House. According to what I read, the book Bringing Down the House is supposed to be nonfiction based on a true story. Yeah, that's that's what I thought when I read it. Yeah, and it it is to a large extent. So there was a ring of MIT students who were playing blackjack 
and counting cards to beat the odds. And they did take home a substantial amount of money. I think it was $3 million over a long span of time. But the ring was much bigger than we see in the movie. And the ring, the blackjack ring in the film has like five to six players. And in real life, there were apparently like 80 MIT students who were doing this. Surely not all at once, but more of a rotating crew of people that showed up at different. Yeah. So it went on from 1979 to 1994. So those seem to be pretty true basic facts that we know about what happened. However, the author of Bringing Down the House, Ben Mesrick, apparently took a lot of liberties with the actual storyline that he puts in the book. And there are people who are like actually involved in the MIT blackjack ring who have really criticized him and said, like, none of this is true. People have challenged him and said, where's your evidence? Like, did, did any of this actually happen? And this is a great quote that I have from him. According to the author, Ben Mesrick, he said, the idea that the story is true is more important than being able to prove that it is true, <laughs> which is basically just like, yeah, yeah, I just made a lot of it up. Such yeah, a funny there's a ton of exaggeration for sure in what happens. You got to make a story. You can't make a movie on something boring. So. Yeah, but he should have just written a fiction book and, you know, done it like loosely based on the events of instead of presenting it as a fiction, as a nonfiction book. Yeah, not a good move. Not a good move. It's much more compelling as a nonfiction book that's that's basically fiction. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Good job as a writer. Mm-hmm. Great job. Really well done. So when they convert this to a movie, they bring on a big cast. And one of those cast members has become a little bit more problematic over time. A little bit. Yeah. A little uh, bit. Uh, let's talk about Kevin Spacey. Do we have to talk about Kevin Spacey? Well, he is the villain in the movie. So he is the villain. They got one thing right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I kind of hate that we're giving him airtime because he did turn out to be such a monster. And I have to say... Like maybe at the time we all just thought he was a really good actor. But like when you watch him now, he just comes across as a total evil person. Like he has such evil vibes that he gives off. I was pretty much done with him when Pay It Forward came out. I don't know. I don't know how we all didn't see it coming. It seems obvious in hindsight. But yeah, he turned out not to be a good guy. So we're not going to give him a lot of airplay. I think we have one clip where we have like a five second or less thing where we hear his voice. But that's it. So we're not we're not uh, trying to promote Kevin Spacey here. We're not fans. Yeah, definitely not endorsing his work. But like Carla said, even though this is a movie we don't really love that much, hmm. there's some good money lessons in here. It, it's yeah. There's a lot of relevant stuff. Yeah, the money lessons are great. Just not something we highly recommend as a rewatch if you've already seen it or if you haven't seen it. Eh, you're fine without going to to see it right now. Another interesting thing about the cast is so apparently a lot of the original characters that the show is based on were Asian and there's only one Asian guy represented on the team so a lot of people were upset that the movie got sort of whitewashed and all the main characters are now portrayed as white with one exception he's not even really a main character he's a side character yeah and he's just like a caricature of a normal person yeah, that's true. He's not exactly anyone's favorite character from the movie. Yeah, so yeah, stealing that's from another... the mate's cart in the hotel and just like stealing everything. Yeah, so Kevin Spacey whitewashing the actors. Two strikes. I don't know. We might find a third strike as we go through the episode here. Why are we doing this again? I don't know. Should we stop? <laughs> no, it's good. We we have a lot of really fun, interesting things to learn from this episode. So yeah, it's gonna be a good episode. It's also not something that is perfectly in our wheelhouse. So I mentioned that I read the book, Bringing Down the House, when I was in college. It was introduced to me by our very good friend, Frankie. And he is a perfect person to consult with on this. And in fact, we do. You're going to hear his voice or see his video, depending on how you're capturing this. Frankie is a doctor. Mm -hmm. Uh, Frankie is also quite the Vegas enthusiast quite the Vegas enthusiast. I've never met anyone who likes Vegas or goes to Vegas as much as he does. Yeah. For the past 15 years, he's been going to Vegas uh, at least quarterly, sometimes you know, seven or eight times a year. So much. Yeah. But uh, it's, he's got the perfect parallel. He is basically Ben Campbell. Right? Yeah, basically. So uh, one thing, I maybe we didn't say this, but the reason Ben gets pulled into the ring is because he's saving to go to medical school. Um, Frankie went to medical school. So we're going to talk a little bit about those costs and what it actually looked like in real life. 
So why don't we play a clip here of the cost of med school for Ben? You know, ever since I was 16, I, I crushed exams. I, I took on extracurriculars. I, I showed up early. I, I even sat up at the front and I stayed late. Now, I, I give up everything. You know, I give up fun. I give up sex. I don't, I don't think he gave up sex. <laughs> okay, maybe not sex. Yeah, I didn't give up sex. No, all right, not sex, but it just annoys me that the one thing that is stopping me from going to Harvard Med is money. Now, tuition fees and living expenses alone cost over $300,000. $300,000. It's outrageous. It's, it's astronomically high. I get that. You know, I, I just thought there was more to life than just money. So his $300,000 is $75,000 a year for four years. Yeah. So there's a lot going on. Lots to talk about here. I think the first point is he does have a point. As That's Josh Gad's voice you hear as his friend that's talking to him, a.k.a. Olaf from Frozen. I was going to say, I thought I knew that voice. Yeah. So Josh Gad is agreeing with him that it is astronomically high. And he's obviously right. That is a very, very large sum of money. And I do sympathize in a lot of ways for people who are facing down that kind of cost. And I we should note that college tuition in general has gone up way faster than the pace of inflation. So general undergrad tuition has gone up more than or about five times as much as inflation. So it has not just kept track with inflation, it's way exceeded it. Harvard tuition has doubled. It's more than doubled the rate of inflation. So it hasn't gone up quite as much as general tuition costs overall, which makes sense because it's a private institution. And a lot of the reason that public tuition costs have gone up is that there are so many more people going to school now. And it used to be that the government subsidies that get provided to public schools could provide a much bigger portion of what a school needed to run. But with that many more students coming in, the government money just doesn't go as far. So they had no choice but to raise tuition quite a bit. But for a private institution like Harvard that is relying on public money, it's private donations, obviously, they're not going to be facing exactly those same kinds of challenges. So it makes sense that Harvard's tuition wouldn't have gone up quite as much compared to inflation as an average college tuition. So I do really want to talk about whether it makes sense for Ben to be going to Harvard Medical School, but we just did that in a recent Gilmore Girls episode where we talk about whether or not Rory should be going to uh, an Ivy League college and whether she's getting the value from that. So we're going to delay that argument for another time, or you can go back and watch that other one, uh, because there's too many other things worth talking about here. So Frankie, you went to medical school, and you weren't rich. How much did it cost? How did you pull it off? I went to medical school at the same time that the movie came out, and so I believe my tuition expenses were something around 14000 a year, and then that added with fees and supplies and everything, we'll say about 20000 a year for tuition plus living expenses. And I think at the time that averaged about 10000 10, a semester is what you could take out uh, in terms of loans. So about $40,000 per year total. So okay. he's paying about a $35,000 premium for yeah. maybe not necessarily an upgrade to his medical school. So roughly paying double to go to Harvard. But I think Frankie makes a point here that seems totally relevant, or he, he kind of dances around it. Loans. Frankie took out student loans to go pay for medical school. Uh, he was able to go do that and cover his living expenses, going to uh, a state school. Why is Ben not talking about that? It does seem like the whole premise of this movie is that Ben is freaking out about how he's going to pay for medical school. And there's just this huge, obvious answer out there, which is to take out student loans. And student loans are such a complex topic. And there are so many people who take them out when their potential future earnings do not justify the amount of debt that they are taking on. But going to medical school, I think, is one of one of the very few super safe bets that you can make in life. Your earnings as a physician are often limited only by your own willingness to take certain jobs, right? Mm -hmm. You can, you can insure 
if, if you are at Harvard Med School, <clears throat> you have the ability to go pay back those loans. You may not be able to go do what he had dreamed up in mind. We don't know what his post-med school plans were, but unless he's planning on being an academic, there's there'd be no challenge with him being able to pay off those loans after going to Harvard, right? Yeah. So I suppose there's the risk that he doesn't graduate or he finishes medical school and decides that he doesn't want to work as a physician and isn't able to go earn the big salaries that doctors are able to command in most roles. But those are really, really low odds. It's it's a risk reward kind of situation that virtually everybody who's going to medical school has to deal with. Most people don't have the resources to go pay for med school. Scholarships aren't available to the same degree that they are for undergraduate mm -hmm. opportunities. You're, this is the classic case of you are going to go take on a risk because the reward is worth it. In addition to you know the role and the opportunity to be a doctor in society, I think it's something that is wonderful that we need. We need brilliant people to continue doing that. But at the same time, it's lucrative. Yeah, extremely. I mean, it does, like, I feel like the whole tone of that clip we just listened to is so whiny. He comes yeah. across as just like, it's not fair. Why isn't the world about more than just money? But in reality, like, this kid is so freaking lucky. His brain is a winning lottery ticket. And he's just complaining about the fact that he's going to have to pay off student loans for a good bit. But he's also like intentionally taking on way more student loans than he has to be to become a doctor by going to this really prestigious school. So I don't know. He kind of comes across to me as someone who just like wants his cake and wants to eat it too. Like he wants to feel the panache of going to a really fancy school, but he doesn't want to have to take on the price tag. And like this kid is going to be fine. He just has to live a relatively reasonable lifestyle for a few years with his doctor's salary and he'll, those, those loans will be gone. Like this is not a tragic scenario by any stretch. Yeah. I think medical school loans are probably the, the most surefire student loans you could go for. You went to law school, Carla, uh, medical school has a throttled down supply, right? There are only a handful of medical schools in each state, mm -hmm. whereas there are way more law schools out there. The admissions requirements for law school are much lower if you're going to go take on this debt to go to random law school X, if you're going to Harvard, you'll be fine as well. But if you're, if you're just trying to go to some random law school, man, I don't know. Uh, th that's a much bigger gamble. And same thing for undergraduate student loans or other oh, yeah. graduate programs. Oh, yeah. Law school is a much bigger gamble than medical school. Like There are a lot of jobs that you could get as an attorney that will pay you a really, really low wage. Like you would have been way better off not taking on all that debt. So law school is a is a way bigger gamble than going to medical school. Yeah, you're not guaranteed to get the income that you would as a doctor. So Ben joins the team because of the promise of all this money. How much money? I mean, he needs to make $300,000, but how much money is he making on the blackjack team? I was becoming a pro on all levels. I made more money in one trip to Vegas than I would have in five years, nine months, 12 days, and six hours at J Press Menswear. In Boston, I was just Ben Campbell. But in Vegas, I could be anyone I wanted. Okay, so he's presented as like a whiz kid in terms of math, and he's really good with sums. And he like rattles off these numbers. He made more in one trip to Vegas than he would have made in five years, nine months, 12 days, and six hours at his like retail job. He works at a menswear store. He making, got promoted in the movie to he, make $8 an hour. Yeah, he's making $8 an hour at the menswear store. So we crunched some numbers on this. <laughs> it just seems like, you know, he's presented as this whiz kid with numbers. But it's such a weird number for him to be rattling off. So if we assume that he's talking about working full time. Which we kind of have to, right? He's talking about 12 days, six hours. So the day he's talking about has to be at least six hours or it would have been 13 days. And his month would need to have, uh, if he's already got 12 days in it, it's darn close to full time. Yeah. yeah. It's ludicrous. That's the only thing that makes any sense is that he's talking about full time. So if he's making $8 an hour full time, assuming no raises, presumably, 
like I think we assumed 50 weeks a year, 40 hours a week. That comes out to $92,816 that he would have made in five years, nine months, 12 days, and six hours working at $8 an hour. So I don't, like, did he make $92,816.50 in his winnings? It's a very bizarre, another corny thing. Yeah. If he's supposed to be some sort of math genius, math wizard, like, and he does a bunch of fun arithmetic in his head in the movie and it's, you know, showing off stuff, which is not the way that people who are actually really good at math use their, that's not what they're good at. Right? Yeah. Arithmetic isn't what people are fantastic about, but nevertheless, it's, it's absurd because we learn in the movie that over the course of 17 trips, he makes a little over $300,000. So he's not making a hundred grand a trip. He's making, I don't know, more like 20 grand a trip. Mm-hmm. So for a math whiz, Eh, I'm I'm not so impressed. I'm also not impressed with the way that the show depicted him as a math whiz. So he's at MIT with some of the best and brightest math students around. And the way that he catches his professor's attention is by answering a question about the let's make a deal Monty Hall problem. The which door should you open kind of thing from the TV show Let's Make a Deal. Uh, it's even still in the air today with Wayne Brady as the host. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> I and. There are a lot of people who they see this kind of thing. They're like, oh, man, I would never have guessed that the answer that they show in the movie is the right answer. But if you're at MIT, you're into math. And it would shock me if less than half or really less than 75 percent of the students in that classroom didn't also know the answer to that question. Right. It is just it's a common problem. If you're into math problems at all, this sort of. uh, Monty Hall paradox, Monty Hall problem, which door do you open, is a well-known thing, and everybody knows the answer to it. (laughs) Frankie and I were in the math club in high school. Everybody knew this. So if you're you're somebody who's there, I'm not trying to be pretentious or anything, but this is not the way to demonstrate that you're some sort of math genius. It just isn't. I mean... It's common knowledge. Okay. Okay, At at, at the (laughs) MIT robotics program that he's part of, common knowledge. Very important clarification because... I think what you're talking about is not at all common knowledge to the common human being. It is not common knowledge for me. Pretty sure I could walk up and down the street and find like maybe one person out of 50 who would know what I was talking about and who could give me the correct answer. No, it's way more common knowledge than that. But Disagree. <laughs> but anyway, in any well, event. Well, the, the short answer is if you're ever on Let's Make a Deal, don't keep the door that you started with. Switch to the second door when they give you the chance to switch. That's what you need to know. That's the takeaway. Okay. But they show him as a math whiz, and that's why they invite him to be part of the team. Frankie, you spent a bunch of time in casinos. You know about counting cards. Do you need to be some sort of math super genius, some sort of math wizard to be a successful card counter? Um, fortunately, you don't need to be a math wizard at all. As long as you can add and subtract, not even big numbers, like add one, two, and three, subtract one, two, and three. As complicated as it might get would be dividing by two, three, or four, but not exactly, just kind of getting pretty close. So the the misconception about card counting, uh, if you mention it to a lot of people, they'll say, oh, well, you know, how could you possibly do that? They use eight decks in the casino these days, or six decks. There's no way you could keep track of all those cards. And you really don't have to, is the thing. Uh, all you need to do is keep track of the ratio of high cards to low cards uh, in what they call the high-low count, which is what uh, these people on the MIT Blackjack team use and that they were using in the movie. Yeah, so what you really need is a good memory, right? Mm-hmm. You need, I mean, not a, not a good memory. You need a, You need to be able to memorize all of the strategy elements for Blackjack. Yeah, that's true. You got to have a great focus. You can't make any mistakes, right? One of the reasons that the casinos were okay with having this advertisement, this movie out there, is that people woefully underestimate the number of mistakes they make with their card counting and they lose their edge. <clears throat> and basically, they're just playing regular blackjack. Yeah. The thing that strikes me about what Frankie's saying is I get it that it's just simple arithmetic and that makes total sense. But. I think he's completely ignoring the fact that you've got to be someone who's 
really, really hyper-focused and has the ability to just tune out distractions, not let your mind wander, which is so hard for us, especially in this day and age where we've like all gotten used to just scrolling all the time and <laughs> facts go by at the speed of light practically. And, you know, we're just constantly having like an input of information and to be able to just turn all of that off and just be focused on every single card that's coming out of the shoe and not lose track of a single one of them. That to me seems like the really difficult part. Yeah. I think the other thing is you do, you don't need to be a math genius, but you do need to have a lot of awareness. They left out some of the critical details about being a card counter in the movie. They don't talk about the concept of the true count. They just sort of talk about the ratio of high cards to low cards, but not how many decks are left in and how, how far out of balance it normally is. Another complex thing about card counting is you, you have to adjust your play a little bit. So when you play blackjack, most people follow what's called basic strategy. It is the set of rules that says, here's what you should do in any given situation. It works out all the time. And if you play perfect basic strategy and you modify your bets based on how favorable the conditions are for you in card counting, you're only going to get about two thirds of the benefit of being a card counter. You have to modify your strategy based on what the count is. So as an example, when you're playing blackjack, when the dealer has a six face up, it's a terrible condition for them to be in. The odds of them busting is really good, right? And you don't want to take any cards that put you at risk of busting when they've got a card like a six face up. If they've got a two face up, similar situation, but some of your cards, like if you have a 12 or 13 in your hand, you're going to want to hit according to basic strategy. Well, I, I realize we're getting into the weeds here <laughs> on blackjack say. card counting, but you have to modify your play. If you have a 12 and the count is really high, like a three or higher, and the dealer's got a two face up, normally you would hit that. But the fact that the count is so high changes the probability of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't hit that and you'd make the dealer take the card. Uh, it's, it's kind of this variation in play. And there's a bunch of those kinds of things. Normally you never take insurance when you're playing blackjack. It's not a good bet unless the count is really high. Uh, which to, in which case it is to your advantage to go do that. So there's a bunch of modifications that you have to do. You have to keep up with. So you have to be cool under pressure. You have to remember what's going on and not make any of these mistakes if you want to get the full benefit. You could just play pure basic strategy and not modify it, but you're leaving about 50% of your potential profits, uh, you know, a third of your pro profits on the table. You can make 50% more. And this is why I'm not a card counter because my reaction to all of that is... Yeah, that is not my favorite thing in the world. But one question that I had after we watched this movie was, you and Frankie do not have that same reaction to all of this, you know, what I view as gobbledygook about the numbers and the strategies because it just makes me tired and bored. But you guys are not tired and bored in reaction to it. It seems really interesting to you. So why aren't you a card counter? Why aren't we making, you know, $300,000 from your card counting skills. Frankie, I'll let you take that one. Several reasons you need, you need a bankroll to start with because even if you're counting cards, uh, there's going to be so much variance or variability in whether you win on a given night or week or month even, and whether you lose. And so you need to be able to withstand those swings and have some starting capital just like starting any business, except it's far more volatile. Um, and the, you know, the, the edges that we're talking about or the, the margins here are very, very small. Um, a good card counter working a common system might be able to swing the house edge to about 2 or 3% in their favor. And uh, when they're working in teams, uh, they can improve on that. But you definitely can't just win every time and win thousands of dollars, no matter what, uh, looks much more glamorized than it really is. Okay. That is shocking information to me that your edge is about two to 3%, maybe like a smidge higher if you're playing with a really good team of people, but holy cow, like we see in the movie, these kids walking away with tens of thousands of dollars every single time they go to Vegas. And apparently that's just wildly unrealistic. Like you have to be in a hundred percent 
ready to lose lots of money for long stretches of time. That seems like a not good idea. Yeah. Th- so there's a bunch of other reasons as well. Probabilities are not super in your favor. You're not guaranteed to win. The distribution uh, of, of results is much more volatile than what they would show in the movie. Uh, the other thing is you can't be a card counter by yourself and be particularly successful. The reason why they did the team in the movie is because the way the card counting works, you increase your bet when the conditions are favorable and when the conditions are unknown or unfavorable, you want to bet the least that you possibly can so that you're losing the least when it's not great for you, but you're betting the most and winning the most when it is favorable for you. It's pretty obvious to the casino when you're doing that. In the movie, they have somebody betting the minimum 100% of the time, and then they have the big money come in when the conditions are good, and they bet big money all the time, and so it's not so obvious that you're making these sorts of changes. A casino will let you vary your bet a lot at the blackjack table because most people aren't good enough at card counting, and it's not really changing the edge in any sort of meaningful way. But if you are really talented at it and you're winning a lot, the casino is just going to ask you to leave. They're going to say, you can't play here. They'll put in rules that say... Uh, you can't enter a shoe in the middle of it. You have to start at the beginning. You, you have you have to play all the bad hands in addition to the good ones. So, you know, you, you, they just make it to where it doesn't work out for you. So you're saying that if I go try to card, count cards, Lawrence Fishburne, a.k.a. Morpheus, is not going to drag me into the back room and beat me up? No, I think that's maybe decades ago that sort of thing happened. Yeah. But... Today, no, casinos are super profitable. Have you seen what they look like? Have you seen how much money they're bringing in? They know what they're doing. But with that said, you can still win money in Vegas and at the casinos. So Frankie and I, we grew up in Louisiana. We lived in Baton Rouge. And on the first winter break after turning 21, I stopped at a casino on my way home from college and played some poker and was up a few hundred dollars. We went to the casinos in Baton Rouge later that night. I think we played some craps, a little bit of blackjack, and I won a little bit more. And we decided just to keep going back to the casino basically every night over this winter break, playing pie gal poker, roulette, craps, you name it, just about anything, but not, not any traditional poker, not any hold'em or anything like that. All games where the casino has an edge. Over the span of a month, I never dipped down below from where I started. I continued to make money. I think I think I finished that winter break up like seven or eight hundred dollars from playing casino games, which sounds crazy, right? You can't go to the casino every day and have that kind of thing happen, but you can because in the short run, the probabilities don't work out like they will in the long run, and that's why everybody goes to the casino, right? You want to yeah. exploit brief periods where things work out in your favor and get out while the getting's good. Most people fail to do that and they end up giving all their money back. Frankie and I, he was up a ton too. Like we just, we weren't playing big stakes or anything. We're college kids. This is really stupid of us to be doing this, but uh, we got really lucky and you won't get that lucky. I don't encourage you to go do it. (laughs) Uh Uh, We saw a ton of people there. There are a lot of unfortunate degenerate gamblers who are are there. Well, people who are in much worse (laughs) situations uh, that we'd see at the casino regularly. Mm -hmm. uh, And, It doesn't always work out for people. But the fact that we could go to the casino basically every day for a month and end up ahead shows you just how unlikely it would be for the inverse situation to happen, right? The casino has a similar edge against us just playing all the games that I was talking about that you would have as a card counter against the casino, right? And the casino lost all those times. You're not going to walk away every session bringing home big bucks. It just, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. I think that's such an important takeaway for people. If you had this idea that like card counting was going to be some sort of get rich quick scheme for you, we definitely want to disabuse you of that notion because the way that it's portrayed in the movie is wildly unrealistic. You're going to have these crazy swings of, you know, really good luck. Like you had a run of when you were a kid and Really, really bad luck. And if you're not starting with a huge bankroll, like Frankie points out, to where you can afford to take that hit and keep, you know, ponying up and keep trying to get it back to where that edge is going to eventually work out in your favor, then you're going to end up losing money, period. Well, and the pit boss isn't going to let you play, right? They're going to see you making 
they're watching how much you're betting. They're taking notes of it. And if you're just betting the table minimum, table minimum, and then you're nearly at the table maximum, they're going to know and they're going to ask you to stop betting that way or ask you to leave. Yeah. So, so takeaway is one, Robert is a degenerate. And two, card counting is not a way to wealth. That said, if you are planning a casino trip somewhere, I highly recommend you go check out the Wizard of Odds website. Uh, this guy publishes all of the probabilities for all of the different games that exist in the casino and all the different variations. And it will tell you how to lose the least amount of money on average, right? <laughs> what, what the best strategy is in each of the different games, whether or not you should be playing any of the extra bonus things that they offer, which usually are a terrible bet. Uh, and whether or not uh, what, what you should be doing uh, to find the game that's the best odds for you. So go check out the Wizard of Odds. That's some practical takeaway. If if you're not going to listen to our advice and, and avoid <laughs> gambling like crazy, at least do it the best way you can. Try to minimize your losses. Yeah, it, I mean, the, the advice that you always hear from people that makes so much sense is just view it as entertainment. If it's something you really want to do, like this is how much money you're going to spend that night. And that's how much you expect to, to lose. And you shouldn't expect to go home with any kind of winnings. So anyway, the kids in the movie do not follow this advice. And like, if I had to guess what their statistical edge was based on the way it's presented in the movie, I would guess it's at like 80 to 90%. Like <laughs> these kids just seem like they can't lose and, you know, everything's coming up roses for them. And they're having a pretty good time in Vegas. So let's take a listen to a short clip of them kind of living it up and winning all the time. But for the first time in my life, the world made itself easy for me. And I liked it. We just paid $210,000. Yes. This is how we play! And play we did. Nothing cost too much. Nothing was out of reach. I guess you could say the casino host of fate gave Ben Campbell a major upgrade. Dorm rooms turned into high roller suites. Bicycles became stretch limos. Okay, before we talk about them living it up, there's a quote in there. For the first time in his life, things came easy to him. I so agree. That's such BS coming from him. Like this super smart kid getting into MIT, got into Harvard Medical School. Like the world is his freaking oyster. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Just not a fan of this kid failing to realize how incredibly lucky he is. He's dominating life. life. And I'm sure he's put in a lot of hard work to get there. But at the same time, a lot of this is just winning the genetic lottery. Yeah. World, platter, Ben, complaining about it. Don't like it. Don't like it at all. So that's a crazy part of the clip. I think just in general, the fact that these kids are spending so much on these lavish parties, going to the fancy restaurants that we see. We see them uh, shopping in the clip. You can't hear that from the audio, but they're like in a Louis Vuitton store and then in some kind of like super expensive lingerie store. I mean, these kids are spending it up. As they say, nothing was too expensive for them. And that just seems so wacky to me because they're treating this as a business enterprise. And you know, later in the movie, we hear them talking about how, you know, this is a business and they have to follow a very strict set of rules. But apparently that doesn't apply to how much they're spending on their actual trips. Like these guys are obviously not maximizing the amount of money that they can take home from these trips if they're spending like crazy every time they go to Vegas. Yeah, they're definitely blowing their profits. I mean, it's no different than anybody with a big income frittering it away on things that they don't really need. But at the same time, if Ben's doing this to pay for med school, it seems a little disingenuous that he would go live it up and, and do the high roller life mm -hmm. and go to all the fancy clubs and stay out all night and blow money on ridiculous fashion things that don't align with the personality he's had for the first 20 years of his life. It seems a little bit silly to me. But I think what's a bigger deal 
than them blowing their profits is them blowing their chances at being the best version of them at the blackjack table the next day. Yeah. So they show them going there for these relatively short trips, like a long weekend or something. You fly in that first night, you play blackjack all night. You do the same thing on Saturday. You do the same thing on Sunday and you take the red eye to get back to Boston and time to go to class on Monday. And it, it just doesn't make any sense to me that you're going to be staying up all night for fun when you have this business role you have to perform the next day that requires you to be at the peak of your mental focus. Yeah. As we already said, it's basic arithmetic, but it's basic arithmetic with a hyper degree of focus. Yeah. The, so. the cards come out quickly. You have to stay on top of things. You have to make your decisions quickly. You, you just can't slow down the pace of play. That's not something that the casino will allow you to do. Yeah. And every decision, especially when the big money's out there, is huge. Yeah. And as we already pointed out, we're talking about like a 2 to 3% margin that they have in their favor, which means if they're blowing even a small fraction of that 2 to 3% edge that they have because they're tired or hungover, then what the heck are they doing? Like they're eating into the teeny tiny little sliver of pie that they have in their favor. Just doesn't make any sense to me. It's not a good move. So they have all this cash and they're living it up and they're spending it up, but they're they're doing everything in cash in a way that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me in the movie. So a couple of examples of this. The first time that Ben flies to Vegas, one of the more senior players on the team takes him into the bathroom, shoves him in a bathroom stall, and they literally tape wads of cash to his body yeah. so they can transport the money to Vegas to go play with. What the hell? <laughs> yeah. Why? Well, I guess I kind of get that they're wanting to use cash only at the casino because they want to stay anonymous with the casino. They take on these different personas each time, right? They wear wigs and like different outfits. Yeah, but why not go to a bank in Las Vegas? Nevada does have banks. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. <laughs> like why transport this across the country in a flight? Why not just go to a bank, deposit your money, withdraw your money, deposit your money, withdraw your money mm -hmm. every session? Like, yeah, these guys don't seem to be big fans of the banking system because we also see that Ben takes his cash winnings home with him and stores them in the ceiling. These like, you know, push up tiles that he has in his dorm room. He like scoots one over and puts his money up in the ceiling, which just made me want to take a baseball bat to the television and like. I mean, what yeah, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. What do you do? <laughs> maybe the first time when you get back and you didn't have a plan, maybe he didn't have much of a bank account set up. I mean, he has a, a job, so surely he does. Yeah. But maybe he's worried about it. Maybe he thinks it'll affect his ability to get financial aid. I, who knows what he's thinking there? But at some point, you got to come up with a plan that's better than leaving the money in your ceiling in your dorm room. That's just the most absurd thing I've ever heard. So the only thing that makes any sense to me is that he's trying to avoid paying taxes on it. He's trying to have the IRS not know that he has this money, which is one, criminal, and a huge risk for him to be taking. Like we've already pointed out, this is a kid who literally has everything going for him in life, and he's going to risk it all for what? Saving like maybe 50 to 60 grand on taxes. I mean, it's just an absolutely... Bad shit crazy for this kid to be taking that kind of a gamble with his life and reputation. Also, the second thing is that he claims he wants to use this money to go to Harvard Medical School. So eventually he's going to have to transfer this money to Harvard. Is he planning on showing up at the Harvard bursar's office with like a duffel bag full of hundreds? And that's how he's going to pay his tuition? I don't think Harvard's going to look too favorably on that. That's not how you paid your tuition in life? It is not how I paid my tuition. Weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's so ridiculous that he's not using the banking system. He could deposit it in a national bank in Vegas. He could have access to it in Boston. Paying the taxes on his winnings is definitely something he has a responsibility to do. You know, by the way, anybody who wins money gambling has mm -hmm. to pay taxes on it. Like if you're a professional poker player, you have to, you have to also keep really good track of what's going on because mm -hmm. 
you pay taxes on the winnings, but you get to offset that by your losses. And you're going to have sessions where you win. You're going to have sessions where you lose. You need to keep up with what you what you did lose and what you did win, uh, what you bought in for and what you cashed out for. If you win like a big slot jackpot at a casino, they're going to give you a tax form. Yeah, for sure. It's I mean, even if you win a hundred bucks, like on a random weekend trip, you're supposed to be reporting that. Yeah, most people don't. Uh, look, I hope the statute of limitations has run that, that period where I won a few hundred dollars that winter break. What? I did not report that. What? On my taxes. Granted, I didn't have substantial other income at the time either, Jesus. so I don't think I would have owed anything anyway. Not but pleased. yeah, if you win, you're supposed to count it. Most people don't win. Most people end up relatively even or down. Yeah, <laughs> but it's an important thing to know that if you happen to get really lucky at a casino, which again, we strongly discourage you from gambling, period. That is the way to lose money, not make or save money. But if you were to hit it really lucky, then you should definitely be reporting that because the IRS isn't going to come after you for seven or $800, one over the course of, I don't know, a month when you're a kid. But they are definitely going to come after you if you don't report substantial amounts of income and you never know when you could get audited. Yeah. And for our listeners out there who are super wealthy and love to go to Vegas and gamble it up big time, stop traveling with big wads of cash on you. That's ridiculous. Just go to the bank. Yeah. Just go to work with the casino. They, you can get your money. Yeah. It's not necessary. Banks are a pretty good thing in life. You should take advantage of them. <laughs> so they're in Vegas. They're living it up, party style, spending a ton of money, staying mm-hmm. in these fancy hotels and that sort of thing. But Vegas is a popular destination. Lots of regular people who aren't winning thousands of dollars playing blackjack go and take trips and they can be super expensive, uh, but not everybody wants to spend a ton of money. Frankie, is there a way to do Vegas on a budget? There's just so much variability in the hotel and flight prices. So everyone wants to go to Las Vegas from Friday to Sunday. And so if you are able to go there Sunday through Thursday, you're going to save a ton on your flights. You're going to save a ton on your hotels, like gigantic disparities. If, uh, if I were flying round trip from Dallas going Friday to Sunday, I might expect to pay $500 round trip. If I want to leave on Friday afternoon at four 30, when everyone wants to go coming back Sunday at 2 PM, those are really good times. They're in high demand, but if you're willing to fly there on you know, a Sunday and leave on a Thursday or fly there on a Saturday when nobody's getting in and leave on a Wednesday. You, know, you could get a round trip flight for maybe under $100 sometimes. So those are some good points about how to manage the cost of a Vegas trip with timing. And then there's fancy restaurants, but you don't have to go to the fanciest ones. There's lots of really good restaurants there. There are, there are super expensive shows and there are also cheaper shows. And you can have a really good time without spending a ton, uh, assuming you don't just give it all away in the casinos. Yeah, which is always a risk. <laughs> yeah, Vegas is definitely not my scene. I'm not into almost everything that they have to offer. But if we wanted to go like see some specific show and have a nice meal or something, it's nice to know that we could plan it on like an off day and, you know, that it would be a heck of a lot cheaper than going on a Saturday. It makes a lot of sense. It's basically like the equivalent of the off season for like a beach destination or something, except for Vegas, their off season is Monday through Friday. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. So in the movie, we haven't talked a ton about a lot of the plot points. There's a section where Ben runs into some conflict with Kevin Spacey's character and his money gets stolen. He gets caught by the guys at the casino who are trying to monitor the people who are card counting and trying to do some loss prevention for the casino. Yeah, Lawrence Fishburne, a.k.a. Morpheus from The Matrix. His character name in the movie is Cole Williams, but we're just going to call him Morpheus. Yeah. Sorry. He's Morpheus forever. Uh, Anyway, he works out a deal with Morpheus to try to catch Kevin Spacey, and eventually he gets double-crossed by by Morpheus. So poor Ben... Mm -hmm. Uh, has his money taken when we play that clip. I'm looking at some retirement. Leave the bag. No. No, 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 no. I need this money. You have no 
idea what I went through. I to get know, this kid, but you're gonna figure out how to get everything you want in this life. Because you're smart. So, you're gonna leave the bag. Yeah, he flashes a gun and says, You're gonna give me the chips that you won legitimately uh, and your bankroll. Uh, you're gonna give me all this money and I'm gonna take it. Yeah. So it's obviously a really cruddy thing for Morpheus to do, to steal money and, you know, flash a gun and thereby threaten the kid's life. But at the same time, I kind of agree with him. Like, he's right. As we've already talked about, Ben is going to be just fine in this life. He really does not need that money in, like, the true sense of the word. He's going to be okay. Yeah, but Morpheus is saying... He's, he's ready for some retirement, right? Yeah. In the movie, they show that his company that he runs to do loss prevention stuff is basically being beaten out by a computer, surveillance footage, uh, algorithms that can go detect what's going on. Basically, he's out of a job, so he needs his money to retire on. But how much money is it? Like, was there enough in this teeny little bag that he tosses to him? Yeah, this is such an interesting question to me. So we don't know how much money worth of chips is in this bag that he ultimately ends up giving to Morpheus. But number one, it looks like a very small bag in the movie. It's really small. Number two, we know that Ben was aiming for $300,000 as his medical school cost. So probably it's not going to be more than that. That would be pretty unlikely. Well, it's not totally Ben's money, right? This is, it's actually Kevin Spacey's money at this moment. So, right. They, they, both Kevin Spacey and Ben Campbell are playing at the table and they shove all their chips into one bag. So it's the money that the, the seed money, right? The capital that they had to start with mm -hmm. to play with yeah, and the chips that they had won. So there's right. a decent bit on the table, but retirement level. Yeah. Well, so at the very, very tail end of the movie, we see like this super quick shot of Morpheus sitting on this really cushy pretty lavish looking it looks like he's at a vegas fancy hotel actually yeah like kind of some sort of beach resort we don't know where it is all we see is him sitting by a pool some like beautiful woman bringing him a drink and it looks it looks pretty darn nice so i'm a little bit concerned about morpheus in the scenario because again we don't know how much money is in the bag but we're probably looking at somewhere in the range of like i don't know 100k 300k four or 500k like none of those numbers would be earth shatteringly shocking but not enough money for somebody at his age to be living the resort style lifestyle that he's yeah so there are some really awesome people out there who retire on really sums like really small sums of money but they do that by not frequenting <laughs> you know lavish resorts with girls in bikinis bringing them Fifteen twenty dollar drinks or yeah, something like that. Yeah, so I don't know. I feel like maybe Morpheus let this money go to his head a little bit, and he's not. If he's truly treating it as retirement money, well, no, it doesn't seem like it's gonna stretch real far. He's totally a hypocrite too, by the way, because in the movie they show him telling Kevin Spacey that he's gonna rat him out to the IRS, right? Like they get they get Kevin Spacey in the back room where they're threatening him, and Kevin Spacey's like, wait, 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 I can give you money. He's like, I don't need money. I've got this money from Ben Campbell. Yeah. Um, and he said, you know, I'm not going to beat you up, uh, but I know this guy. He works at the IRS. I think he'd be really interested to know about what you've been doing because clearly Kevin Spacey's character has been uh, evading taxes as well. But like Morpheus just stole money from Ben Campbell. And you think he's taking that money to the IRS? He's going to report that income and pay taxes on it? Heck no, he's not. And the other thing is, he didn't, he didn't just steal it from Ben Campbell. He stole it from his employer, right? That's so true. He's a, he's a contractor being paid to provide security. And he works out a deal with Ben Campbell to go play in a way that his employer has said, we want you to prevent this from happening. We yeah. don't want people card counting on your watch. And he says, oh, I will let you go do this thing that I'm being paid to prevent and then take the results of it. It's yeah. basically embezzling, right? Yeah, it's definitely criminal law on a couple of different levels. At the very least, it's breach of his contract with, yeah. the, with the casino. It's ridiculous. So 
I, I, he seems so smug when he's saying the IRS would love to learn about what you're doing, but he's committing similar crimes himself. So I mean, I guess get off your high horse, Morpheus. Totally fair. We do not know for a fact that he is not reporting the stolen income to the IRS, but but he did steal it anyway. He so. did steal it, and there it would go. be pretty surprising if, yeah, like no one else in the movie has been reporting their winnings to the IRS. It would be kind of surprising that one person at the very end, but maybe. Maybe he's made of stronger moral fiber than any of the rest of the characters we see. One never knows. Yeah. So in the movie, they have to add some drama and they have this crazy finish, right? Where, you know, Ben double crosses Kevin Spacey and they get the money. Then Morpheus double crosses Ben and he gets that money. But there's another triple, quadruple crossing going on in the background. (laughs) Ben has invited his MIT friends. We didn't really talk about it. He was part of this robotics competition with Josh Gad and another guy. Olaf. Uh, well, Josh Gad, Olaf, same guy. Uh, <laughs> there's a second character whose name I can't remember, but he did a good job in the movie. Good actor. Uh, and this 209 competition, which is actually like a based on a real competition that exists at MIT, he gets his, his brilliant friends and teaches them how to card count, brings them to Vegas. And while all this stuff is going on, at the same time, they're playing like big players, just like Ben and Kevin Spacey are. And they're doing it with their money instead of Kevin Spacey's money, right? I guess they got some seed money from uh, from Jill or from somebody else, some of the other Kate players. Bosworth. And they're playing. Morpheus gave them one shot, one last night before the updated security came in and changed the game forever for them. And it's ridiculous, right? They go in this one time. They have one opportunity. And he's going to bring in two people who have never done this sort of thing before. And they're going to use their own money in this last ditch effort to go make a bunch of money expecting to be double crossed by Morpheus. And while it makes for some great cinema, we already talked about the probabilities for this sort of thing. The edge isn't that good. They could have been the casino on those nights when Frankie and I was there where we ended up ahead despite them having a small advantage. And... It's crazy to think that they would take their own money, not the seed money from a business from somebody like Kevin Spacey, who's running this operation for one night. Like they could have just lost it all. How ridiculous. Yeah, just more poor decisions, more bad people who are supposed to be great at math actually being really bad at statistics, probabilities demonstrated in the movie. So, yeah, the takeaway is do not do what they did in this film. Do not risk large, important sums of money that you need for other things on gambling because even if you can do the very difficult thing of getting becoming great at counting cards, your edge is still just going to be razor thin and you can fritter that away with just a few small mistakes. Yeah, you need a long run, which doesn't exist in the span of reality for people so yeah stay away watch it and if you're gonna go play like i said check out the wizard of odds <laughs> <laughs> or take my advice and just don't gamble period fair enough but so those are our takeaways from the movie 21 yeah uh if you like the movie great if you think it's just kind of meh hopefully you learned something fun today yeah thanks so much for tuning in guys take care